So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Miguel Sena. Um, I work for Microsoft and I'm a Linux kernel maintainer. And today, today's talk is about Larnac, it's about sandboxing, it's about security. And we'll just start with a simple story to introduce the topic. So let's say, well, you work for, the, for a company for an open source project, doesn't matter. Uh, you're building a product and well, it's used um, all over the world. Uh, well, it's open source, of course. And well, you get um, worldwide coverage in news, but internally not for a good reason. So millions of machines get compromised because of, um, well, confirmation of your software. You're a developer, uh, what you can, do, can you do to prevent that? So first, how could this happen? Uh, well, bugs. There are bugs everywhere, of course. Uh, we try to mitigate them, but there are bugs, that's a fact. Uh, there are also malicious actors, attackers, that's also a fact, which means, well, there are um, exploited vulnerabilities. And, well, that's real life. For instance, if you don't know, there are some uh, online marketplace uh, when you can buy exploits. And well, this can give you some ideas about the, the cost of such an exploit. So that might not be for every, well, use cases, but it's definitely useful for some actors. So what can we do about that? Remove all bugs. Well, that would be nice, but in theory, well, uh, you know, that's not really possible. We can reduce them as much as possible, but we need to live with them. So use another magic uh, programming language. Well, we can use uh, better languages, safer ones uh, that can give more uh, guarantees, but uh, it's not a silver bullet. You cannot solve everything. Test everything. Well, we can test most use cases and we should, of course, but attackers try to target uh, kernel cases. And well, that is difficult to Test everything, of course, well, not possible. So yeah, that's the right solution. Encrypt data, well, that's a good thing, uh, but yeah, it doesn't solve our problem here. But uh, the solution is to limit access of what our software um, can request and can have. The idea is really to protect data. So here we're not talking about, well, Admin rights, of course, this will not be granted to everyone, um, but really to be able to identify and isolate different use cases for different kind of data. So that might be, well, your email to personal um, love letters, uh, some uh, pictures, some uh, document for specific customers, and so on. There are a lot of use cases. Well, we could use virtual machines. Um, well, you, you all know virtual machines, that's good. Um, but yeah, it's not really designed for, I mean, security or at least to enforce an access control on specific files. Uh, and of course, well, you might not want to, to ship uh, a software and service with a full virtual machine. Um, yeah. Containers. Um, containers are well, well known from developers. That's good, uh, much lighter than virtual machines, um, but uh, not really an access control system. And there also comes with, uh, well, drawbacks. For instance, you need to embed a lot of dependencies and, well, if you want your product to be secure, well, you need to keep an eye on all the potential updates and updates, well, the whole container uh, for every piece of software that should be updated. So that also has a cost. And well, it is not an access control system again, and it comes with, um, it might come with some configur configurability, but yeah, it's not dynamic, and yeah, it's not what you want. But Linux provides different kind of access control systems. Um, among them, you can find Apamos, Linux, Mac, or Tomeo, which are all Linux city models. So these are real access control systems, so that's good. But here, we are just uh, developers. We're not system administrator. We don't 
own the system and we don't want to. Um, and these access control systems are designed for the whole system to enforce a whole one to access control on the whole system and all the, these services. And well, this might have some other uh, consequences like uh, complexity and static configurations. BPF LSM is kind of a, a new LSM and it is great because it can enforce security, well, dynamic security policies. But again, it is designed for a system-wide security policy. Um, so yeah, it doesn't fit uh, with what we're looking for here. And well, it's not really designed, at least not really now, um, to fully handle file paths, for instance, which is the main goal of uh, what we want to achieve here. There's also SecComp, SecComp BPF. So that's good because SecComp is designed for infinite use cases. So you don't need to, well, give more access rights to your applications, to your product, to be able to sandbox itself, to protect itself from attackers, let's say. Um, so it's good because it can reduce the kernel kind of attacks to face and you can embed it such security into your application. So that's what we're looking for. And fortunately, it is not an access control system. It just kind of a firewall for your kernel. And it also comes with some uh, issues. I mean, it is designed this way. Um, it is designed to filter syscalls. So if, for instance, some of your libraries um, might change um, the underlying syscalls, or uh, even you might update the libc or whatever, uh, well, that might break uh, your application. And one of the, well, the downside is, well, because it's infrage, it is also scoped to a set of processes. But that's what we're looking for. So that's not really drawback. And then there's non-lock. So it was introduced a few years ago in the Linux kernel. Um, it is a real access control system, so that's good. Um, it is also dynamic, and you can embed it a security policy inside your application. So you can kind of compose different security policy without uh, requiring any system administration, administration uh, rights. One of the downsides is that it is scoped to set processes, but once again, that's good for us. That's what we're looking for. We don't want to mess with the whole system. So sandboxing, what is really security sandboxing? So quickly, it's a way to restrict execution of a set of processes to a limited set of resources. This is a more literal definition, but that's the idea. Uh, what we mean by sandboxing, we mean um, we want to tailor a security policy to one use case, and especially we want to embed a security policy into an application, which means that we will be able to kind of tie these security restrictions to the actual use case, um, actual um, use case for uh, the launched application. For instance, if your application um, might create access to some files according to uh, command line arguments or to configuration files, well, that might be um, handled, handled without specific configurations. I mean, specific configuration for the access control system. And everything which is kind of dynamic, uh, interact with the user, might be uh, well, kind of dynamic, so um, it might be not be a good idea to rely to a, a static access control system. So what I mean by dynamic policy composition is, for instance, uh, well, you might want to launch an application which is, which is sandbox, so it is, well, it protects the outside world from itself, good, but you might also, for instance, launch a shell, and is this shall launch, um, well, create a sandbox environment and launch another sandbox applications. So uh, you might have nested sandboxes and you can also have sibling sandboxes because you might want to launch different applications at the same time, of course, and each of them need to have an uh, access control system. So it is really tailored to each use cases. So that's what I mean when I, I talk about um, composition of security policies. So when you want to use a sec um, security sandbox, 
we want it to be safe. We don't want uh, this mechanism to be able to harm the system. Um, so we want to follow the principle of least privilege. Uh, we don't want to use any set to ID binaries. Um, we'd want it to be secure and safe for the system and for the applications to not interact and to not um, change the behavior of other components of the system. And of course, we want it to be, well, secure, so to not, well, have ways to bypass it. This is not new. It's used on a lot of different operating systems, uh, like, for instance, on um, iOS, OpenBSD, VPSD, Windows, and others. But until now, without Lanlock, well, we didn't have such a feature for Linux. So what is Lanlock really? So there are two use cases for Lanlock. The first one is to use, to use it to, to sandbox, to create a sandbox environment in which you will launch interested applications. So you might well, want to download a script or some stuff that you might not uh, trust too much or that you just don't have time to review, but you still need to, to launch and to use them. So you might want to create um, an interested, uh, well, a sandbox environment and then launch, well, unmodified application inside this, this environment. This kind of the same use cases are for containers. You launch environment and some stuff inside. So you can do that um, with Lanlock because, well, you can do, it is a kind of feature. So you can use tools to do that. But you can also, and that's really what matters the most in, in our use case here, it is to um, sandbox your own application. So you're, you're the developer of an application, of a service, and you want to sandbox this service. So in this case, you want to protect against exploitable bugs, um, but you're the owner of the code, so, well, you trust yourself, and you want to protect your customers, your users. So nice candidates for the use case are, for instance, complex software, like parser, archive tools, file format conversion tools, and so on, and also complex software like web browsers, and also uh, services exposed on the network, like web services and, and so on. So from developer point of view, there are few interesting um, and useful development properties with Slanlock and with such sandboxing mechanism. First, you can test it. Uh, it is not difficult to do it. It is kind of a, like any other feature provided by the kernel uh, because well, it doesn't require a special environment in the CI. You can use just a stock kernel, just a bit up to date, and use that and test that and make sure that your application, the sandbox application, can access data outside of what it should do. So that's good to make sure, well, it works and it doesn't break, um, well, legitimate uh, workflows. Um, also, because, well, you can compose different security policies, even inside one application, you might have different processes. Um, well, you can have different small policies. And, well, the smaller the policy is, the easier it is to maintain. And as a, another advantage and consequence of that is that you don't need to rely on a system-wide security policy that you might need, for instance, to have a dedicated team to work on that, uh, to, to aggregate different security policies um, to form a, the system-wide security policy. In the case of Planlock, uh, that's the goal of the kernel. Every application <coughs> defines their own security policy, and the kernel composes all of them automatically, keeping all the guarantees we need uh, for safe sandboxing. And, well, because we want to test it to make sure it works as expected. Uh, there's a well-defined backward compatibility story with that. We a defined ABI and set of, of features which are provided and you can probe that and make sure what well, your application will use um, as much as possible, which is possible with a running kernel because you don't know on which kernel your application will run. So how does it work? Um, well, the idea is simple. Um, on Linux, when you launch, when you run, a program, uh, it gets a lot of um, ambient rights, uh, mostly well, the, the rights that the, the user that launched the application has. And the idea with Slanlock is to restrict that. So 
um, according to the kernel semantic to what is a file, what is a, a socket, and so on. Uh, and thanks to three dedicated syscalls, you can define security policy. So we'll see that in the next slides. Um, so what is important to keep in mind is that these security policies are inherited across all new children created from a sandbox process. Otherwise, it would be trivial to bypass the sandbox. And there's, of course, uh, no way to disable such a sandbox once it is enforced on one process. So right now, um, Linux provides a set of implicit restrictions which are required to provide security guarantees to, well, to make sure that the process will not be able to trivially escape the sandbox. And of course, there are a set of explicit access rights. And that's the one that you can configure. So there are mainly uh, a set for file system access rights. So to be able to read write executive files, uh, do uh, some LTL commands, rename some files, and so on. And currently, there's only well a few for network access rights, but we are kind of growing this uh, set. And why you can connect, you can control um, on which port your pigeon and your service can connect to or can bind to. There are also uh, upcoming IPC scoping, which are designed to uh, well, make the sound scoping more hermetic and to avoid uh, connection through abstract unique socket outside of the sandbox. And the same for, well, to, to make sure that sandbox process cannot kill uh, process outside the sandbox. So how do we use it? So I talk a bit about the compatibility ABI versions. Um, so it's really easy with one first syscall, Landlock create toolset, you can ask the kernel um, which version of Landlock is supported. And with that, uh, you can infer many things to use based libraries, which features are available. So the kind of the first step after that is to create a toolset. So you first need to define which access right will be denied by default. And then you ask the kernel to create such a set. So you can see here um, that you define the first argument, first attribute, and a set of access rights, and you fill this argument to the create dual set syscall. And then you get a file descriptor a rule set file descriptor. Then you can add exceptions to this deny by default, by default security policy. Uh, you define that with um, a new kind of argument. For instance, here, you define that you want to be able to execute or read files in um, a file archy. It is identified with an open file descriptor, so you can either use what well, a path or uh, a past file descriptor. Uh, well, you build this argument and you pass it to a second syscall, landlock add rule syscall. The first argument is a rule set file descriptor on which you want to extend the properties and you pass um, this rule, this exception that should be allowed, that is legitimate. And then once you add, you add it AV exceptions, you define what your application legitimately need to access. Um, you can kind of pledge to the kernel that your application will not require more privileges, uh, for instance, by executed certified binaries, which could be a way to escape uh, the sandbox. And if you don't do that, you'll not be able to sandbox uh, yourself. And then you call a third landlock syscall, landlock restrict self, and you pass as first argument the landlock file descriptor rule set. And then if it returns without error, the current thread, the current process is sandbox. So a bit about um, adoption. Um, it is available in most Linux distributions, I would say, and the one which are not supported yet, uh, well, they are ongoing work to uh, help that. So if you are mainly on, on one of these missing distribution, please, uh, well, ask to get some support. 
um, your users will thank you. Um, there are also a set of helpers that are available to use and unlock. So you might not need to change your application. You could also use uh, Sandbox tools. Uh, well, the most common is uh, Setrieve. So you can use that if you want to release Sandbox to really create a Sandbox environment. Uh, but others also are uh, getting support for Landlock, for instance, FireGel and MinGel, which is both uh, a Sandbox tool and a Sandbox library. There are also uh, Rust and Go libraries, uh, even Haskell and some other libraries, which are not official, but still uh, very useful. And uh, there are also one interesting library, which is called, well, which is kind of a, uh, um, well, which try to do the same thing as Pledge, which is um, an open busy um, sandbox mechanism. Uh, but this one is designed for Linux, so it is using both Secom BPF and Lalock. Um, there are also, well, a few, but it's growing. And so that's only a, a few examples of, um, I would say, a different kind of applications. Uh, so it's really useful for, yeah, wide. Uh, range of use cases, um, for instance, um, to view documents, um, to well um, handle cache in your package manager, um, to manage virtual machine, um, detect uh, intrusions in your network, uh, deal with uh, blockchain, um, well network VPN, even a local search engine, which my, um, for instance, I read interested data and others, for instance, are uh, useful tools such as um, archive managers like Exe utils. So that might ring a bell. Um, so Landlock is used by developers um, and you might be the next ones to use it, but it is also getting noticed by attackers. So there's an interesting story here. Um, so at the beginning of the year, Lanlock, um, well, the Exe utils tools gain support for Lanlock. So uh, Exe deals with a different kind of arc, well file formats, and so yeah, it is, it is definitely the kind of tool that you want to sandbox because yeah, it is yeah exposed to wide range of attacks, and so it gain support for well. It, 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 it's getting support from Unlock. It was, uh, you could use and sandbox, it, it use it sandbox itself. So uh, that's good without any configuration. And so, yeah, there were um, some minor issues and some backdoors for th this project. And one less known changes, which was introduced by this attacker was to stillly, stillly uh, disable sandboxing. So, well, you can get a look at the uh, QR code here to, to see the kind of um, bug that was introduced. It's really hard to spot. But here is kind of the solution. Um, it was, in a check, it was a, an extended check to make sure at build time that sandboxing was supported. But if this check did not build, it just always disable sandboxing, and that's what it did. It was an, well, a dot which was introduced here, so the test program at build time always return, Landlock is not supported, you don't need to, to build it. Um, so yeah, that's not a Landlock issue, that's a, well, this specific project uh, issue uh, that was solved, of course, fixed with this commit, but yeah, that's interesting to see well, that might be useful. So you can try Lanark if you want, um, especially with this tool. So it's really a, a sample tool, uh, but an easy one to install. So that might be, yeah, useful to test. Um, so there are ongoing changes. Is Lanark is really gaining more and more features over time. Uh, so we are adding more and more access rights. Um, of course, uh, keeping compatibility with free versions. Uh, for instance, we uh, will get support to socket creation uh, control, 
uh, to, for instance, be able to completely restrict access to the network to sandbox applications. And we're getting kind of similar extended support for UDP port filtering. And all of that, again, is without any um, system-wide changes, without a uh, net filter, without um, such case. It is really standalone stuff inside your application that can be used by anyone if they have well, uh, an up-to-date kernel. Um, we'll see, well, working on um, adding audit support uh, to make sure, well, it is easier to debug and also to get some metrics. So that is useful when you have such a um, security mechanism on a wide fleet. And yeah, we also started to develop a new sandbox tool to make it easier to use without changing applications. And well, we are trying to improve adoption, of course. So thanks to a lot of different contributors, um, Lonlock is growing, getting more and more features. And if you want to contribute, well, feel free to uh, contact us. Uh, there are a lot of fun stuff to do. Um, if you want to uh, add new access types for your specific use case, uh, if you want to yeah, try to get into the kernel development, if you want to add new tests to test stuff to make sure it works, um, if you want to improve libraries um, or even documentation, if there's some issue there. And of course, if you're kind of uh, um, suspicious about if this is really working, you can challenge the implementation and well, make sure by yourself it works. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now or to send them uh, to mailing list. Thank you. <laughs> and for any question, you'll get a free sticker. <laughs> So um, that's not, so the thing is, it works really the same as, yeah, the question was, um, do we, does Lanlock works, works with set to ID binaries? Kind of, yeah. So Lanlock works the same way as Secom works. So you can use it on anything, but uh, because it is an unprivileged access control system, you don't want a process that works itself or it's for your children to be able to escape the sandbox and be able to gain more privileges to do a privilege escalation, you can do that with set to ID binaries. So if you're able to execute a set to ID binary, you will gain more access rights, you gain more privileges, and that might be a way to escape sandbox. So that is not allowed by, by landlock. It is not daily part of landlock, but it is required to enforce uh, useful uh, sandbox and working one. I have another question based on that. So if a parent or a grandparent uh, runs a set UID binary which itself runs a user binary, is that inherit the original landlock rule? Yeah, the question was if a set UID binary or a privileged process, uh, sandbox itself, uh, will its children, children of future, well, future ones, um, in with sandbox. And yes, they will, always, there is no exception. Even for root, uh, whatever your capabilities, and yeah, you always keep the restrictions. You can only add new ones. Yeah. So if a landlocked uh, program runs to the same user and whatever bad command, that bad command will not run. So So I would describe two use cases. Uh, let's say you're in a sandbox shell, you want to use SU. SU is a set to ID binary, so you will be able, able to execute it, but you will not gain root privileges. So treating to another user will just be denied by the kernel. If you're using SU, you're not in a sandbox environment, then set to ID are allowed, like, well, in common Linux system. Then you can switch to another user, and in this new user session, you might want to launch sandbox applications. In this case, yes, it will be able to create a sandbox environment in this context. What I was thinking 
thinking of is, let's say I have a program which is not allowed to read files. But uh, I'm evil and I want to read files. I run to the same user, so I, I don't need to provide a password. And uh, got some files. So it's the, the that, that cat will still have the restrictions that it cannot read files. Yeah, so the question was, if um, I'm already sandbox, I'm a sandbox application, I execute sue uh, with, the, let's say, the same user, and would that be a way to escape sandbox? The answer is no, because you'll not be able, well, you could, well, you cannot change user, that's one thing. Uh, and if you keep the same user, you'll not be able to drop your restrictions uh, because it is still a child process. Okay, that's great. Yes. So this is a new interface, and uh, you want to disable namespaces for system support, for node for user for the team. So this does not affect the last stand of the program. Yeah, the question was, so it is a new interface, and you would too, in the latest version, disable uh, user namespaces. Yes, correct. This, is, this does not, Lanark does not rely on user namespaces, does not rely on namespaces at all. It is a kind of a, a compulsory security feature, like second. So it works on Ubuntu, um, any version of Ubuntu, yes. Any last question? There are nice stickers here. Thank you.